great. So we're ready for our last presentation of the afternoon. I'm pleased to have Jennifer Grabner. And for those of you not from right around the Columbia area, uh, this is a presentation about a project here in Boone County, which is the county we're in. And uh, so Jennifer's going to talk to us about uh, a learning garden that uh, she helped get going there. So Jennifer. Thanks very much for coming. Um, like, this, like he said, we're down in Ashland. We, uh, about five years ago, a friend and I, Leslie Moylan, um, as we got to be friends, realized we had some shared interests and passions and decided to start a school gardening program, um, not really realizing back then what it was going to turn into today. But it, it's really grown phenomenally and turned into quite a program. Um, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to ask. Just a little bit of background on me. My training, my education is in forest ecology and wildlife biology. Worked for the state for several years as a research botanist. Um, then when we had our second child, decided to stay home. Got more into gardening. Um, been a lifelong gardener, but got more into gardening with our kids. And that just kind of blossomed uh, into the passion that I have for it now. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so five years ago, Leslie Moylan and I started the program, and we just started as a, we decided to start as, as an after-school club with our elementary school. We, she had a background in sustainable education, and I had the background that I just listed for you. So we did a little bit of research up front, and it was very clear, even five years ago, all the research showing multiple benefits for school gardening programs, particularly within a, within a public school setting. And these are just some of them. Um, obviously, it, it helps to increase the interest and improve attitudes towards eating fresh fruits and vegetables, um, improve the, the nutrition knowledge, helps improve attitudes toward the environment. Um, a lot of the education, environmental education that kids get today is pretty negative in nature. School gardens are, are, have been shown to be a way to get the information to the kids, but in a much more positive way, in a way that shows them that they can actually make a difference and help not just learn about the problems, but learn what they can do to kind of mitigate some of the problems. Um, and then, of course, when you're dealing with schools, the all-important test scores um, across the board, seeing lots of improvement, especially in science and math scores with districts that have school gardening programs. Um, so this is just our mission as it stands right now. Um, basically, we want to provide space and resources for our teachers. We want to do this in a fun way, but in a, in a real hands-on learning way. Um, and we want to promote this not only within the school, but also throughout the whole community. And that's been a major focus of ours from the start, is to do this as a partnership, ju not just with the school, but with the entire community. And to give you an idea, like he said, Ashland is just south of Columbia, so we're halfway in between Columbia and Jefferson City. Kind of a, a pretty typical bedroom community in a lot of ways. Most families have at least one person that works either in Columbia or Jeff City. Um, but the school district in that area is very strong, very well-respected school district. So uh, to kind of give you an idea of what we do now, we, we focus in two main ways. We have an after-school club that we still run, and we also do a lot of school day programming. And the, the focus for our school day programming is really kind of three things. We want to try to make direct connections with the classroom curriculum, with what the teachers are already teaching in the classroom as much as we can. And we do this in multiple ways. We also have learned, and the kids have taught this to us over the years, if we don't save time at each garden lesson for them to go around and taste the vegetables that are growing out there, then they, they actually get mad. <laughs> and they've, they've even said to me, Mrs. Grabner, can't we just eat some kale or something? So. <laughs> So we learned right away, really, that that has to be part of, of each experience. The kids are really asking for that. And then it's also, you know, really just an attempt to get more physical activity into the school day. Our district is like a lot of districts where we've had to cut PE time, we've had to cut recess time. The, the sports that the kids are involved with is all pretty structured um, kind of activity, so this is just a chance for them during the school day to get up and move and use their hands and feet in a, in a different way. 
And, and our goal typically for each semester is to work with each teacher in our preschool through fifth grades at least a couple times each semester. So what that means, we have the 35 teachers from preschool up through fifth grade, about 700 kids. And so we try to get all of them out there into the garden a couple of times in the fall and a couple of times in the spring. And that can be quite a challenge a lot of the time, but for the last three years we've done that successfully. Just to let you know, we, we're a 100% volunteer organization, um, have been all five years. We've got over 60 different people that contribute and volunteer their time each year. Last year we logged over 2,000 hours of volunteer time, and that was not including mine or Leslie's time. So quite a, quite a broad support for it. Give you an idea of some of the things we do with our school day programming. We can touch on anything in the garden. It's not just science or nutrition. We do a lot of social studies, literature, art, history type lessons. Some of the examples you see in the left corner there. With fourth grade, they do a big unit um, studying Laura Ingalls Wilder and her pieces of work in the spring. So we have planted staple crops, talked about the books like Farmer Boy and Little, the Little House books, and we have samples of old farm tools that are out there just kind of as decoration around the garden. So the kids come out, make connections with the books that they're reading in class, learn about why it was so important back then to plant those staple crops and how to harvest and store them, and just make a, a kind of a hands-on connection with, with that literature. The same for down here in the right corner, the Japanese garden. Third grade does a big social studies unit on Japan in the spring. And so we've, for a couple years now, learned about Japanese styles of gardening and, and getting into using small spaces wisely, um, but just kind of getting into the culture of that. And then we plant things like Tokyo turnips and some of the other Asian vegetables that grow quickly and grow really well in small spaces again, to tie into that. Um, we do a lot of eco-art projects out there, so we make more connections with how to recycle and use some of that recycled material as art and decoration in the garden, painted our rain barrels. We do a lot of stepping stones and sun catchers and things like that out there. And then another social studies unit that we touch on, we, we'll do a Three Sisters Garden each year, and that touches on the Native American tradition of planting corn and beans and squash. And then we can bring in a nutrition lesson with that and talk about how those foods work together to make a complete food, a complete healthy proteins. Um, so just lots of ways to bring all kinds of GLEs if you're a teacher, grade level expectations or core um, standards, touch on multiple standards with each lesson, get a lot of, lot of integration and enhancing the classroom learning. Uh, more examples with math and science and nutrition, of course, you know, a lot of these are just no-brainers when you're, you're out there, but um, we've done quite a few math lessons ranging from learning how to do, it's kind of hard to compete with those guys, <laughs> learning how to do multiplication arrays, the kids have to learn to visualize, say, three times four, that math problem, they have to be able to create a, a visual array of three columns by four rows, well, we do that in the garden all the time, right, when we plant. So we'll talk about square foot gardening. Then we lay out their arrays. They do some math, decide on an array that they're going to plant in. And then all winter long, now the fourth graders are watching as their turnips and their lettuce and things are growing up in the shape of the array that they plant them in, hopefully. And sometimes we get a you know, handful of turnip seeds that somehow get dropped here and there. But... But uh, there's a lot of randomness when you're gardening with kids. <laughs> um, other math lessons that we do, just simple measuring, you know, in second and third grade, they're learning how to measure in different units. So we take uh, tape measures and rulers and yardsticks and things, and they go around and just measure stuff in the garden. Also in fourth and fifth grade, they're working on how to uh, calculate perimeter and area, things like that. So the raised beds that we have out there are all geometric shapes, triangles and squares and rectangles. So they go around and measure, you know, they'll predict first how much area they think is there and then they go out and actually measure it. Um, again, just a 
a way for the teacher to teach what she's already teaching, but to do it in a different setting, a more fun setting, and, and just something that the kids are more likely to remember when they're doing it. We do a lot of wa water cycle lessons with fifth grade. They do a big um, weather unit in the winter and spring. So that's with the, with the rain barrel picture there. We, we love to dig and compost with every grade. So we always get out there from kindergarten on up and explore the compost, learn what's going on as things decompose and just ooh and ah over all the bugs and cool stuff that, that we find in there. That really, I think we could just have piles of compost and everybody would be just as happy. <laughs> so just some examples of, of lessons that we do. With the after school club, it's for third, fourth, and fifth graders. Um, it, it's really a, a popular club. It has, has become too popular for us to handle right now, which is a good problem to have. We had over 50 kids apply for our fall club. We were only planning to take 15. We decided to up that to 20, but we still have 30 kiddos. And these are all kids that have not been in the program already. So out of the 300 kids in that building, that was quite a strong response. So we're hoping to run two separate programs in the spring if we can get enough volunteer leaders to do that. But with the After School Club, of course, we want to focus on just teaching basic gardening, how to plant, how to water, you know, fertilizing, weeding, all that stuff. And then we do a lot of cooking and nutrition with the after school kids. They love to be able to get into the school kitchen and work. That's a, that's a huge treat for them. We're lucky in Ashland because we have, still have full service kitchens. They, they've actually cooked their food still there. And the staff has been more than accommodating for us. So we're able to use both the primary and elementary school kitchens, do a lot of cooking with the uh, after school kids. And then, of course, we want to get a lot of physical activity in there. We, when we first started out, um, I guess it was the first semester, we thought, well, with the after-school club, part of the time we'll have the kids journal about what they've been doing or what they're working on in the club. And the kids made it pretty clear that they were not real interested in journaling. They'd been journaling all day long. <laughs> They wanted to move, they wanted to eat, they wanted to move, they wanted to really you know, just be up and moving. And so we realized that, that that part of it that we thought would be so cool, a couple of kids got into it, but most of them really were just done with that part of the academic side of school for the day. Um, so that was a good lesson. And then we do a lot of eco art projects. The kids, they love to do, um, we've got, you can see the ceiling fan blades over there, our flowers. and. Um, so we get a lot of donated ceiling fans now. <laughs> and ours need to be replaced now. The, the paint's worn off and the blades are falling off. But so we, we just try to do a lot of that kind of stuff. Make it a fun space as you walk in. You know, it doesn't look like an adult's garden. It looks like a kid's garden, one that's welcoming and lots of room to run around in there for them. So this just kind of illustrates where our volunteers come from, which is everywhere. It really is one of those projects that pulls in people from just about every walk of life you can imagine. The thing that they share is that they care, of course, about the kids, and they want the kids to have that connection with their food, connection with the land, and they want the schools to do as good of a job as they can, and they see that this is helping. So we really have a, a tremendous group of volunteers, and it just keeps getting bigger all the time. The same throughout the community. We've got a huge list of groups and agencies that have supported us for the last five years. Um, really, this kind of is everybody that's in the Ashland area that <laughs> is on that list in some way or another. So I kind of just was trying to think about reasons that the program has been so successful and been so well received and this is what I came up with. We from the start knew that we wanted to focus on quality programming, offering a, a quality experience for the kids and for the teachers um, and not just quantity. You know, we didn't want to just get two lessons with every classroom teacher every semester and not care about the quality of it. If we couldn't do a good job at it, then, then we weren't going to do it and that's been important. Another thing is that the school, from the very beginning, has been very generous, very supportive. 
the Ashland School District is lucky in that they have a lot of land of, that they own, um, so space is, has never been an issue for us. I know of, of other districts around the country and around the region where the administration is, is reluctant to let a group of parents try something like this for liability issues or, or whatever. We've never run into any of that. They've just been completely supportive, but we've never asked them for anything. We've never asked them for money. We've never required the teachers to do anything they didn't want to do. So I think it's been kind of that give and take. You know, we haven't presented it as, you guys need to do this. We just presented it as, if you want to do this here, we'll, we'll help you make it happen. And I, I think that's been important. We've always had the long term in mind. We knew that we wanted to keep this going and, and hopefully get this to be integrated into the school's curriculum so that after we're gone, other people can just easily take it on. Um, and part of that was setting up a, an initial steering committee, which Bill was a part of. Um, and then we last year we incorporated as a nonprofit, so we now have a board of directors that kind of sets our long range visioning, makes sure we stay on our mission and, and vision. Um, and like I listed before, we've all, we've have a strong, active base of community supporters and partners, and that's been key. Um, and just constantly networking, doing things like this to get the word out there, let people know that. Not only do we need help and volunteers, but we're also available as a resource for programs and schools that are interested in starting up a similar thing. Um, we have recently have applied for a Missouri Foundation for Health grant and, and have been notified actually that we're being recommended to their board for full funding, which you know, if their board approves that in the middle of November, then that's going to ramp us up to a whole new level. That's going to mean um, one of the main things we proposed for that grant was to develop a community partnership, a healthy community partnership, to bring in all the folks that have supported the Learning Garden over the years and to bring in even more community groups and kind of um, work towards getting healthy living, healthy living initiatives throughout Southern Boone County. So we're going to be working with the city of Ashland to get more sidewalks and parks and bike paths in the community, working with the school district to improve their wellness policy, trying to get a uh, farm to school program going down there, um, walking school bus program down there, all kinds of initiatives that we hope to get going with that partnership. Well, it'll, the grant will also allow us to expand and work with kids in the middle and high school levels, not just the younger grades, which we're very excited about. We've got teachers that are already itching, ready to put beds in over at the high school. Um, and it will also allow us to do a lot of outreach out into other communities and areas around the region, like I said. So keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> Hopefully that will go through. And this, again, this is this the long list of all the folks that we've already made contacts with who are interested in being part of this partnership to make the things on the right actually happen down in our community. And these things on the right are, are things that we think we'll be able to do, but given the, um, the climate in the community and the state, just the interest, the high level of interest of all these partners, I, I really think we've got an excellent shot of being able to do all of these things on the right and more. It's just, it's, it's a really good time for our community to work towards this. Um, in fact, I, I made another connection today with somebody who was like, yeah, let's get a rec center built down there. So um, I think we're gonna be able to do some cool stuff. So just kind of summarizing, what can a school garden do? Um, and what is it doing for us? It's enriching our public education. It's providing a space for teachers to have an outdoor classroom space and to extend their classroom learning in a way that they weren't able to before. We're getting our kids excited and interested in eating fresh fruits and vegetables, um, and definitely in a way that most of these kids didn't know what chard was or kale or had never eaten a sweet potato or anything like that. And so now we have kids that are a lot more educated about where the food com comes from or where it could come from um, and just more interested in eating healthy. And it also really can be a way to unite a community. And we've seen that without a doubt. Um, you know, 
people come together in a garden and around kids, and it's just a good combination. So I think that's all I've got. I don't know if I'm on time there, but... No, we did not have SARE funding. Uh, thank you. She asked if we had SARE funding for this project, and we did not. I think the way that I got put in this um, talk category, I, I'm a former SARE recipient myself. We ran a, a winter vegetable farm for a few years, and so I guess somebody got a hold of me through that and said, hey, you want to give a talk? But yeah, we, we are actually thinking of going for the SARE educational funding next year because we want to put in an outdoor, um, kind of an outdoor classroom space where we're going to have an outdoor kitchen and space to be out of the wind and rain. I didn't see on your list uh, cooperative extension anywhere. Are they not in 4-H? Are they not? She in said she point? didn't see on the list uh, MU. I guess you're talking about MU extension, cooperative extension. And they were on there, MU extension. We've worked with them. At least they should have been. Maybe I left them off. We don't have a 4-H club that's part of it right now. We're not technically partnered with them. Um, hopefully in the future, I know we've got a couple of active 4-H groups in our region. Um, we haven't worked with them directly, but, but we will, because I know they've got great curriculum materials and things like that. It is, you definitely, you definitely. And with Extension, um, we've received money through Extension's Healthy Lifestyle Initiative. They've been supportive that way. Uh, Vera Massey, Ann Cohen, and folks like that work quite a bit with them. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the big problems in the community I live in Kansas is the soil's real bad, and we try to establish these gardens without doing the raised beds and amending the soil. You can't get funding for something that's not there or already working up. Huh? How did you get uh, things started, and did you have to worry about uh, establishing the garden? Uh, yeah, um, the question, he said, in his community, it's, with the poor soil, it's hard to get things started, get the upfront funds, I guess, for raised beds with good soil in them. Um, in hindsight, we, we maybe would have done a little more upfront research and, and got money ahead. Leslie and I didn't do that. We just said, hey, let's do a garden. And so we were literally working in a mud pit for the first year, um, and we just... We got the local hardware store to donate some scrap lumber, and we slapped, literally slapped together raised beds with the kids and just started piling compost. We would get compost from here at Columbia, their, the city composting program, 12 bucks a pickup load, and you get a, a, a compost that's plantable. It's got a great texture. We would just mix that with the soil that, that's there and with some other compost just over the years kind of built it up like that. But we used our own funds out of pocket for some of that. We received a couple of small grants through the, um, I think it's National Gardening Association. They have a kids gardening program with Home Depot. They've got a, a school garden grant program. We received a couple of $500 uh, scholarships from them. And that goes a long way. Most of the other stuff was just donated from the community. Um, Really, supplies like that has not been an issue for us to get donated, uh, either from businesses or individuals. We say, hey, we need some shovels, or we need some dirt, or can you use your tractor for half a day and help us? And we've got enough people around the area that are more than willing to help out with that. I'm sorry? How many schools do you have gardens? How many schools? We just have one garden site. We're, the Ashland Southern Boone is just one school district. They have four buildings, and the current garden site is right next to two of those buildings, the primary and elementary, the lower grades. We're getting ready to put more beds in over by the middle and high school, which are on the other end of town. But we're just dealing with one school district. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Joan mentioned that whole, the Whole Foods Foundation has a school garden grant, and they, they actually have an open call right now um, for school garden programs. And there are actually several smaller grants available. You spend 
10 or 15 minutes online and you'll, you'll bring up a whole list of, of grant funding opportunities. Usually they're within the $500 to $5,000 range. Some of them are specific for starting up a school garden. Some of them are specific for maintaining a program that's already existing. But if you check out that kidsgardening.org, I guess, website, you'll, you'll get a lot of resources from that one page. I'm sorry? American Community Gardening Association? I think it's through the National Gardening Association, NGA, yep. But if you just Google kids gardening, it should come up. It'll be one of the top four or five lists that'll come up there. 